March 15, 1944. The morning silence over England breaks to the hum of 800 B-17 flying fortresses assembling in heavy gray sky, each harboring 10 young men and enough TNT to erase city blocks. Every returning plane brings another harrowing tally. Bomber losses surging, fighter escorts outmaneuvered, tactics stale, confidence faltering. The briefings grow grimmer. Fortress crews recalling tumble-down formations chased by ruthless German aces, the RF sidelined by weather, and the Luftwaffe's seasoned predators waiting for first sign of weakness. The challenge is existential, captured in the haunted eyes of squadron commanders. How do you break the cycle of attrition when your enemy has dialed in the rhythms of your war? Statistical reports from the European Theater of Operations tell a merciless truth. On missions through Brunswick and Schweinfurt, American fighter wings lost 14 Thunderbolts while confirming only three German kills in their first month of operations. Bomber squadrons dread the radio calls declaring, fighter escort turning back. Those moments when the little friends peel away at range limits, leaving gunships exposed to calculating foes. In the haze of defeat, a bizarre suggestion emerges from the battered hangars of the 359th Fighter Squadron, stationed outside Norwich. Daniel Danny Weiss, Brooklyn artist turned makeshift camoufleur, sees possibility in catastrophe. He sketches the aftermath on P-47 cowlings, rivulets of oil streaked alongside bullet holes, the scarring of shrapnel trails and scorched panels. The impulse isn't vanity or show. He's memorizing the patterns of vulnerability as a new language of survival. Weiss's fixation draws interest from Tony Martelli, chief mechanic, himself a survivor of two mid-air bailouts and an inveterate rule bender. Over coffee brewed with radiator steam, the pair jokingly discuss veil of weakness, paint healthy planes to look barely airworthy, bait the Germans into reckless pursuit. Their conversation echoes with skeptical laughter from the morning crew, but Captain James Red Holt, the squadron's restless flight leader, senses untapped opportunity. Holt has flown tight escort duty for months, seen too many bombers shredded, too many of his fighters running empty after dogfight minutes run out. It feels heretical. Warfare doctrine touts intimidation, bold insignia, glossy nose art, but Holt's gut tells him the psychology of air combat can be reversed. Why not cloak strength in weakness? Make our fighters look limping, let them underestimate us. When they pounce, we unleash. He requests permission for a limited trial. The brass, desperate for any edge, quietly overrule the protests. If paint wins us sorties, notes Colonel Dickman, let art outthink steel. The first six thunderbolts undergo transformation. Every detail matters. Smoke residue is rendered by rubbing lamp black mixed with engine oil across turbocharger housings. Bullet holes are ringed with hand-cut decals. Oil leaks simulated with shavings soaked in hydraulic fluid. Weiss sketches not just wounds, but the illusion of fatigue lazily feathered props, slightly off-center trim. Martelli oversees adjustments to flying technique, training Holt's flight to drop speed by 40 miles per hour, lose altitude gradually, and present themselves to enemy spotters as mechanical carrion. The modified planes fly their first mission March 17th. Holt leads three painted decoys, trailing behind the bomber stream near Bremen. Their appearance is bleak, described by a tail gunner as halfway to the scrapyard. German FW-190s, hunting from above, disregard the tight escorts and close aggressively on these apparent stragglers. They dive to finish the kill, the old pattern, only to be ambushed in turn. Smoke generators are cut off, the decoys snap into full throttle, weaving into attack positions. The result is immediate. Six down German fighters, a single thunderbolt suffering minor flak, and bomber crews surviving runs that would have otherwise ended in disaster. What starts as a desperate experiment evolves into doctrine. Within a fortnight, the veil of weakness tactic spreads through the group. Crews compete for most convincing paintwork, brushing on scorched marks, mimicking patched panels, inventing stories for every simulated wound. Holt's logbook notes, enemy hesitation 12 to 18 seconds at point of contact, an eternity in aerial combat. Weiss's creations are now a secret weapon, classified by headquarters, violating Geneva norms, but celebrated in the mess hall. Losses drop, kill ratios spike, and every sortie becomes a test of deception and nerve. By March 24th, three decoy missions are launched over Bremen. 
Within 30 days, this clandestine art and tactics experiment delivers an audacious result. 40 German fighters ambushed and destroyed, 180 bomber crewmen saved who statistically should have died, and an exponential spike in squadron confidence. In the weeks following the first successful engagement, the vial of weakness undergoes rapid transformation from offbeat experiment to officially sanctioned stratagem. What began in a drafty East Anglian hangar now spreads through planning meetings and briefing rooms across the 8th Air Force. The results are too startling to ignore. Mission after mission, painted P-47s fly just behind bomber streams, trailing convincing ribbons of smoke, panels patched with worn acetate and decals, so meticulously hand-weathered by Weiss's crew that even American pilots sometimes double-check before final pre-flight. Commanders marvel at the emergent choreography. Hunters and bait planes navigate through mission profiles with an actor's flair. Holt hones the subtleties of performance, reduced speed by 40 miles per hour, erratic changes in altitude, the occasional lazy waggle to mimic a pilot fighting controls. Weiss refines his palate, muted browns and fresh metallic streaks, oil stains brushed in the shadow of the cowling, mimicking field repairs and emergency patches seen on returning bombers. The real art is in the layering. Physical decals blend with smeared pigment, and the mechanics become actors as much as technicians. German fighters, accustomed to easy prey in the form of straggling bombers and damaged cripples, respond exactly as hoped. Wolfpack intercepts, pioneered by Luftwaffe aces like Gunter Rahl and Adolf Galland, are confounded by an enemy that no longer obeys the rules of vulnerability. Now, every wounded American plane could be a loaded gun and a hidden kill team. Intercept logs show hesitation growing, pilots pausing at visual range, their radios filled with uncertainty. Is it real damage or another trap? Captured German pilots later recall the creeping doubt, the shock of seeing dead fighters revive, shedding their disguise in explosive moments of predatory violence. Each decoy sortie becomes a small opera, the staging and performance refined with each act. As March advances, the complexity increases. Smoke generators, first jury-rigged from spare canisters and a captured BF-109 system, are standardized, producing thick, realistic trails at the flip of a cockpit switch. Mechanics invent detachable panels, fashioned from lightweight acetate and held by fabric fasteners, designed to flutter loose and slipstream, manufacturing the appearance of fresh catastrophic damage visible even at combat distances. Squadrons start building performance checklists. Drop airspeed no more than 40 miles per hour below formation. Bleed off altitude slowly. Avoid sharp dives that look staged. Feather a prop once every three minutes. Fly slightly out of trim. Fight the stick as if wrestling real controls. Stay just inside radio range of the main group to maintain the plausible connection to the bomber stream without giving away the ruse. Records show that by end of March, Commanders in the adjacent 56th and 361st fighter groups arrive in unmarked jeeps, feigning casual visits, but eager to observe demonstration flights of the 359th's decoys. Lieutenant Colonel Joseph Dickman, tasked with oversight, conducts silent inspections, walking the line, pressing thumbs to fake wounds, peering at cut switches for smoke and oil. His logbook entry is curt. This violates three articles. It also works. Authorize expansion. It is a moment that would shape the air war psychology as much as its physics. By early April, the tactic achieves institutional memory. Debriefings note a drop in average bomber losses down to 2.8% per mission from 5.2% the month before. The kill to loss ratio on fighter sweeps soars to nearly five per one in American favor, a figure nearly unheard of since the start of the daylight bombing offensive. The change is dramatic. Every successful ambush means 10 more men home to write letters, a dozen more planes returning with the painted memory of deception turned deadly. Adaptation comes, of course. Within 48 hours of a major loss, Luftwaffe intelligence circulates reports. American fighters now employing deliberate deception. Damaged appearance may be camouflage for ambush. Exercise extreme caution. Yet the very act of warning slows the German response. Field commanders, uncertain, start holding back junior pilots and cautioning aggressive aces. What looks weak may be strong, confesses one captured Luftwaffe pilot, shaking his head in disbelief. 
By mid-April, mechanics rotate through schools teaching fake damage technique. The process is codified in field manuals as operational disruptive camouflage. American fighters in the Mediterranean and Pacific theaters hear rumors of the Norwich trick. Some try their own hand, P-38 Lightnings flying decoy with scorched wingtips, field-made smoke rigs on Mustangs. For a brief incandescent moment, American ingenuity and psychological warfare upend an entire enemy doctrine. Throughout this time, the bomb group's faith in their little friends grows absolute. Veteran gunners, once resigned to their fate, spot wounded fighters falling behind, only to watch those same P-47s flare and climb as the trap snaps shut, the sky alive for seconds with cannon and tracer. Every successful engagement becomes mess hall legend, retold each night against the murmur of coffee and bourbon, the shadow of tomorrow's mission always looming. As the fake damage gambit takes root, German fighter doctrine is disrupted in ways their commanders never anticipated. Luftwaffe pilots, trained to ruthlessly pursue stragglers and finish crippled aircraft, are suddenly confronted with a mystery. The easy kills aren't falling from the sky. They're fighting back with unprecedented ferocity. In debriefings, ace pilots like Major Egon Mayer report to their group and commandeur that several damaged thunderbolts appeared operational engaged in complex maneuvers, and inflicted surprise losses on attacking elements. The myth of American weakness, once cemented by early war attrition, is shattered, replaced by a climate of confusion and wariness. German tactical manuals are hurriedly updated, warning against targeting apparent cripples without confirmation. The head of the Jagdgeschwader issues a directive. Assume damaged American aircraft retain full offensive capability. Approach with caution coordinate all attacks. Instead of acting swiftly, Luftwaffe hunters pause to confirm kills, seconds lost in hesitation, seconds that cost lives when thunderbolts spring their lethal ambush. Meanwhile, the American squads perfect their act. Beyond paint and decals, pilots learn to sell the disguise with expert energy management. In one recorded engagement, Holt orders his wingmen to fade low, slip into erratic formations, then bounce from dead to deadly in a blur of engine roar and converging 50 caliber fire. Nearly a third of Luftwaffe losses in April on key missions are attributed to surprise attack from painted decoys. The feedback loop is relentless. German intelligence captures mechanics near Antwerp, interrogating for confirmation. Are your planes truly this durable? Has American technology improved? The Americans, half amused, half proud, remain silent. The Thunderbolt turkey shoot becomes legend not just for its firepower, but for psychological shock. German pilots, short on ammunition and forced into constant alertness, suffer combat fatigue. Some refuse to pursue lagging Americans, violating old doctrine for survival. In squadron mess halls, the accounts stack up. Pilot Walt Mahurin, destined to become one of the first American aces in Europe, writes to his family. When they come for what they think are easy kills, we show them what real American grit looks like. Our biggest weapon isn't always the gun, it's knowing how to make our enemy doubt. Every squadron debrief now includes tactical training on deception, energy management, abrupt reversals, and synchronizing attacks from fake damaged flights. Diplomatic repercussions follow. Some high command staff question whether this tactic violates principles of fair conduct. Geneva articles on false flag and battlefield deception. The response is quiet but resolute. In existential war, tactical advantage supersedes all but the highest codes. If paint can save 890 American airmen, reads the official memo, we remain within the spirit of survival, not violation. By late April, Luftwaffe morale is noticeably degraded in many sectors. Reports document delayed attacks, reduced eagerness among green pilots, confused retreat after initial engagement. The paint trick hasn't rendered Thunderbolts invincible, but it has made every straggler suspect, every engagement complex and risky. American escorts now operate not as expendable shields, but as the sharpest edge of Allied air power. The final days of the fake damage campaign mark the climax of improvisation, where the thin line between survival and defeat is painted, literally, across the battered fuselages of American fighters. As Luftwaffe tactics adapt, Allied squads push further. A new cadre of airmen, once skeptical, now vie for the most convincing disguise, 
Some P-47s even incorporate field-rigged flak damage with removable panels and colored oil that would streak in flight, signaling a crippled engine or pierced cooling system. Mechanics become sculptors of credibility, continually updating paintwork to match the latest genuine combat scars. We were part craftsmen, part con artist, Mahurin laughs in a 1946 interview. The numbers are more than folklore. By late April, squadron kill-loss ratios hit 6-1 at peak, the highest of any tactical innovation in the European theater. Across hundreds of missions, over 890 bomber crewmen returned who statistically should have died, directly attributable to reduced German aggression and the precision traps set by fake damaged fighters. Survivors write home with gratitude, sometimes unaware of the performance art that saved them. I thought I saw a dead friend's ship trailing us, but then the Germans came for it. Our boys roared to life. Four fighters fell. All ten of us made it home. Because of paint. Because somebody realized looking weak when you're strong is sometimes the only answer. This improvisational doctrine echoes in post-war analysis. Tactical deception, honed under duress, is memorialized not only in military manuals, but in the living memory of tens of thousands. Bomber crews who survived impossible odds tell and retell mess hall tales for decades. When historians audit the data, the impact is clear. Not only did the 359th Fighter Squadron flip the script on the Luftwaffe for a crucial month, but their legacy seeded psychological doctrines for generations to come. After the war, the study of operational disruptive camouflage becomes an object lesson in tactical innovation. NATO instructors in the 1950s cite Norwich's trick as seminal. Learn from desperation. No solution is too strange if it buys you time, confusion, or lives. Museums request surviving P-47s with original paint damage. Some are preserved exactly as last flown, a memorial to the artifice of survival. Pilots who became aces attribute their most legendary victories to deception in the air. National archives declassify the records only in the early 1990s, surprising even veterans who never knew their contributions were once top secret. The influence spreads beyond air combat. The lessons of veiled strength inform Cold War deception, special operations camouflage, even electronic warfare. In squadron reunions across America and Europe, old rivals meet, sometimes embracing with wry smiles and stories. The chase, the disguise, the moment surprise became salvation. As time passes, technological advances render old tactics less relevant in practice, but more powerful in symbolism. Today, the spirit of innovation, of daring to defy convention, to camouflage not from weakness, but from strength, lives wherever survival demands more than courage alone. When asked, surviving pilots and mechanics say it straight. Sometimes war is won with a brush, a lie, and the hope that when the trap snaps shut, your enemy's last thought is, I have underestimated them again. Thus, the story closes not with a single dogfight, but with a legacy legible in every confrontation where fear, improvisation, and psychological mastery hold the future in suspense, painted on wings, engraved in memory, and whispered through generations, as proof that against impossible odds, sometimes deception is the highest form of courage.